In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the role of the amygdala and the seahorse in memory. All right, being a little bit cheeky again, but in my defense, the scientific name for seahorse is hippocampus because it's Greek for literally bent horse. Now you know. So the hippocampus is located in the brain right here. It's this purple thing that sort of goes around. It's described as being like a finger-sized structure that lies interior to the temporal lobes and connects to the frontal lobe, thalamus, and amygdala. It's part of the limbic system, which you may know is involved in emotions, learning, and formation of memories. Unlike most other parts in the brain, cells in the hippocampus can actually continually reproduce, which really helps with memory formation, specifically for explicit or declarative memory, such as learning to spell, which is actually a really complex task. In one really interesting study, London taxi drivers were found to have more activation in their hippocampus for a navigation memory task than for other types of memory tasks. In a related study, MRI scans found that while the overall size of the hippocampus in taxi drivers was not different than the rest of the population, the posterior part of the hippocampus, which we believe is used for spatial navigation, was larger. Now, of course, correlation doesn't imply causation, and there could be other possible explanations, but the evidence does seem pretty good that the hippocampus plays an important role in forming these memories. In fact, other studies have suggested that you can predict just how well a participant will recall items based on how much activation has occurred in their hippocampus during the learning. Another study showed that the hippocampus is important not just for memory formation, but also the retrieval of declarative memories. The study involved rats and floating surfaces in a small pool of water. It's weird, but pretty interesting. Go check it out if you want. Now, it's important to note that the hippocampus doesn't actually store these memories. It only helps to consolidate them. When we say consolidate, we're referring to a process in which the brain forms a permanent representation of that memory. So you could say the hippocampus starts the process of consolidation, and then these memories will later get transferred out into the relevant lobe of the brain where it should be stored. And this predominantly seems to happen during slow wave sleep when memories are processed. Yet another reason why getting the proper amount of sleep is so important. Now a whole bunch of things can affect how well your hippocampus functions, psychological factors, brain trauma, or other health related conditions. All right. Think of a really exciting memory that you have, such as your team winning an important game or your very first kinder surprise. Chances are you're not just remembering the facts of the event, but also the emotion associated with it. However, emotion is an implicit memory, so it shouldn't be formed by the hippocampus. So why is it so tightly linked to your declarative memory of the event then? Well, it's because of the amygdala, crucial in helping you form implicit memories such as emotions. And so we could really just summarize the role of these two parts of the brain by saying that explicit memories are acquired by the hippocampus and implicit memories are acquired by the amygdala. There was actually a key study done in this area by Bakara et al called Double Dissociation of Conditioning and Declarative Knowledge Relative to the Amygdala and Hippocampus in Humans. Once again, self-explanatory, roll credits. Sometimes it can hurt you okay, so this is what happened in the study. There was a person with a damaged amygdala, a person with a damaged hippocampus, and then of course the control, who wasn't actually this small. So what they did was randomly show these people a bunch of colored slides over and over. But after a while, after every blue color was shown, a ship's horn was played for one second at 100 decibels. They basically wanted to find something really annoying, and they did, because they were able to record an unpleasant sensation in everyone. If you're curious as to how they did that, they measured something called a skin conductance response. Anyway, after doing that, they then showed the slides again, but this time, after showing blue, no sound followed, and something really interesting happened. In both the control and the person with the damaged hippocampus, they still sort of like flinched in response to the blue, like they were able to record that unpleasant sensation. But for the person with the damaged amygdala, no response was recorded. Why was that? Well, the amygdala was necessary in remembering the discomfort. That emotional response should have been processed by the amygdala, and that's why this person wasn't able to remember it. In other words, no conditioning had occurred with this person. There was no learned response to that blue color. Then they asked the participants this question, which color slide was followed by the boat horn? The person with the damaged amygdala said the blue slide, and so did the control person. However, the person with the damaged hippocampus said, I don't know. And that's because the hippocampus was needed for explicit memory, memory of the color that produced that discomfort. It's pretty amazing to think of the things that we've learned from people with brain injuries, but also how specific the brain is when it comes to storing memories.